in Guinea. And I'm like, so what? What does that have to do with the rape? Right, right. Yeah. So they're raising questions that they're not supposed to about her. She got more than one bank account and all this other stuff. So, you know, it, 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 and, and the thing is, what let me know that the sister had some integrity is when DSK's people went up to 116th Street, 7th and 8th Avenue in that area with the Continental Africans, primarily West. They went over there and they started out at a quarter of a million dollars. They went all the way up to over $450,000 trying to get one African, one Continental African, to say that she was a whore or a prostitute. That's what they went to. Now, I know some of them over there is struggling. Somebody over there has got to be struggling. Nobody bit and went for that carrot that was being dangled in front of them. So I could have gotten mad at all of them because they all participated in it. Traditional organizations that liberty of death and all that stuff, none of them helped that system. 100 blacks was able to get right to the front of the line. Easy. It wasn't anybody else there. Now later on, later on, the New Black Panther Party did. United African Movement did. And even at that time, you could still get a good seat because it wasn't anybody rushing to her aid. So if I want to get mad, I can say I ain't never talking to those no good, you know what, anymore. They didn't help her. They attacked her. And I know that in 400 years of history that I know of in this country, no white person, to the best of my knowledge, has ever went to jail for raping a black woman. And in this room, we every complexion under the sun, from the lightest of light to the darkest of dark, yet no white man has ever gone to jail for raping a black woman. So either black women are liars, and they're very, very accommodating, or, or something's up because they all seem to be liars. Every black woman that's ever said she was raped has lied. You know, when all is said and done. So I could, I could very easily get mad at all these organizations, and I'm not going to name any of them, but if you name them, I'm just going to go there. <laughs> if you name them, I don't have to name them. But when you say, what about so and so? And what about, well, they blacker than blacker than black. Yeah, okay, sure you're right. See if they was with the system. Right. All that liberty and death and all that crap, you know, <laughs> and reparations they asked for. They weren't with the system. So all these organizations supposed to be so black, they weren't with it. So I'll, I'll stop there and say. So to answer your question, I think they should get together. There are certain things, um, you know, um, a part of a part of the apology I was taught since I was little, that a part of the apology is to identify what you did to the person. Like the extent of what you did. If, it, if I did something wrong to you, I identify what I said. I know I did such and such to you. And then you apologize for it. Right. And then the third component is to say, how can I um, uh, make up for it? Can I do such and such to make up for the wrong I did? So those three things are uh, a part of uh, making up. And, um, and I don't see that happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, don't like, mm -hmm. okay. I like to ask a question. Um, in the black politics in the city, they, whites have forcibly threatened people. It was a, a group called the Borbies. That was very the what? The Borbies, years ago. No, I don't know. The the Boy, Boy. Yeah, the Borbies, the Sydney, yeah, he would know. Like, even, even I think I'm uh, ripping the Alderman. They said those schools and attack people and stuff. Okay. Um, they were black? They were Italian. They were really Italian. Oh, okay. But they actually used to go to schools and cut girls' breasts off and do that. When we tried to establish a party here in the, in the Brooklyn Central. Um, I think Charles Barron was threatened. I know Alton Maddox was threatened. He burned down to the park. He did a lot of things. Okay. Um, also, Dr. Jeffrey, I hope Dr. Jeffrey G. has got And he told me, I'm going to just bulletproof vest because I'm threatened. Oh, no doubt. Uh, could that element be a reason why Charles Barron didn't challenge? I'm just asking you to kind of say it. 
Um, Can I interrupt for a second? After this question, could we focus it more on the campaign because the brother is running uh, okay, okay, mayor, yeah, so yeah, we yeah. want to focus on how we can help them mm -hmm. uh, attain that office. But um, okay, you know, after this question. Yeah, well, I, I would say that I spoke to Charles on that day and the day thereafter, and at no time did he mention there was a threat to himself or Inez. So I don't know about that. Um, I don't, I don't I, you know, uh, there was no threat assessment, to the best of my knowledge, with okay. respect to uh, a threat. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, here's sir. a question dealing with you becoming mayor. Okay. Uh, you know about the prison pipeline. What kind of programs would you propose to help our young people stop this rampant pipeline, the prison type system we have going on now? Well, I, I would say that those who uh, put this um, prison industrial complex together, they're extremely thorough. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, one thinks that the pipeline starts the minute there was um, an arrest affected right out here in the street, but it's really not. You know, uh, you'd have to look at the school system first. Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Most governors in, in major uh, states know that they can judge how many prison cells they need by the grades by the fourth grade. So by the fourth grade, they can estimate how many prison cells they're going to need. Uh, consequently, they also know that, um, uh, that upstates and rural areas where most jails are, and New York State is upstate, and other places it would be in wherever the rural area that it feeds the economies in those areas. So it's not an accident over the last 20, 30 years, you know, to see the black population, you know, inmate population uh, really increase, and women also mm -hmm. included. Uh, the numbers are high. That's not accidental. That's a part of a systemic approach uh, from the governors on down. And, that, and I'm not precluding uh, the federal government, but I would just say, State, on a state-by-state state basis, the governors know uh, where, you know, they have towns that the only thing in that town is a prison, a university, and maybe a hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's just about it. But well, how do you combat it if you become How would I combat it? Yes. Well, for one thing, we would stop the stop question and frisk. We would stop that the way it's currently being um, practiced. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, you have to have, that. you cannot take stop questioning Frisch from a police officer. But when it's based on racial profiling, it's unconstitutional. Uh, I was telling somebody today, if I see you with a piano, a grand piano on your back, <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna stop you. And I'm gonna ask you, where you going and where'd you get the piano? Cool. You know, two o'clock in the morning is not the ideal hour to move a piano. And certainly if you have a grand piano, so and the only way to get it around is on your back. <laughs> I think there's a little problem. So you got you have to have a form of stop questioning, Chris. It's just a matter of how you implement it. So certainly I would stop that the way it's currently being done. And then you have to have a system in place for youthful offenders and first offenders. And then even with all of that, and especially first offenders, you have to you the answer can't be throw them in jail and throw away the key for a first offender because some kids are good kids, they just follow us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and even in that, and you also have to take into consideration, is there a substance abuse problem? Okay. Because oftentimes, you know, when, when people are being picked up for reefer, having a, you know, a joint or two in their pocket or smoking it in the street, or you, people are drinking an open container and all those things, you have to be able to filter all of that out, and um, you need a better answer uh, as opposed to incarceration. Whether it's uh, programmatic, you just need something other than incarceration. And certainly you could, uh, if you uh, got the churches, especially prominent black churches, to open up their doors and send these young men to them, send them to uh, big brother type black organizations that can bring them in and talk with them. Develop a rights of passage. Make that young man that was called Reefer go through a rites of passage. Okay. I mean, that might sound lame, but I'm telling well, you, uh, it it'll works. work. If you can that's put that young man under uh, 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 Dr. Jeffries or somebody, right. send him to them. 
they know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying there's an alternative to incarceration for especially for things that um, you should throw away the key for. Right. Okay. Yes, brother. Um, you made reference to a during the course of you proceeding to the state office building that there was a another meeting planned and later that evening. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of who the participants might have been in that meeting mm -hmm. and what positions they might have been taking? Well, okay, you had most of the black elected officials in this town were there and people like de Blasio uh, was there. Uh, you had Reverend Sharpton chairing the meeting and at that meeting we were told uh, by people in their camp, including um, Reverend Sharpton's camp, that there was going to be a thumbs down. We was told that, that night prior to and early that morning that they were going to go with the thumbs down. So we said we were going to uh, go uptown and to uh, real, raise the salient points with respect to uh, these were all rumors and innuendo. Nothing was ever proven. Uh, when you start talking about he's had rendezvous on the other side of the GWB, that's his business. That has nothing to do with government. If you say that uh, he had a uh, a sexual encounter in a closet in his office. I mean, that's silly. I mean, who would go in the closet, you know, when there's a roof or something like that? <laughs> 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 why, why do you think the you know, so, was there? So I'm just saying that. I, we didn't believe none of that. So, um, why do you think the Blasio was there? Well, I, I think that you have to understand that uh, he, had, he obviously had a relationship with uh, Reverend Sharpton, because if he didn't have that kind of relationship, as an elected official, um, he should not have been there. But I think he was there because not only did he have a relationship with Reverend Sharpton, but he also had a relationship with the Attorney General's office, which was Andrew Cuomo, okay. which is why um, he was there. He was there finding out to give the um, a New York State Attorney General Andrew Cuomo on site intel as to what went down at that meeting. So all of them who were on orders to go thumbs down, he was there to verify their thumbs went down. And he could report directly to Andrew Cuomo the next day. And we know that well because we were threatened by people in his office. We were told first, while I was driving, I didn't even know that Noel Leader was being threatened in his car. I'm driving up to Harlem from Brooklyn, and they're first telling me, look, y'all guys have always wanted something done about stop and frisk. They said, we have the power to stop, stop, question, and frisk. And we'll do it. Just do not support the governor on it. That's what we were told. By his staff, who we had met with weeks earlier, complaining about stop questioning Chris. They said, do not do the press conference, and we will stop, stop questioning Chris. They said, we have the power to do it, and we'll do it. Just do not support the governor. Give up your press conference, go back home, and we'll take care of stop questioning Chris. And when we said, no, we can't do that, they said, wait, 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 wait. We're telling you to do it. And we said, we're not going to do it. We've decided to support the governor. And they said, now we asked you. Now we're telling you. If you know the power of this office, we're telling you, you better not do it. You don't want to be our enemies. And after some words, which I care not to repeat, you know, we communicated to them. We proceeded up to, you know, the Adam Clayton Power you know, State Office Bill. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Others, please. Who's next? Um, uh, yes, brother. Uh, in terms of your candidacy, oh. support for your candidacy, mm -hmm. um, what stage is the uh, Guardians and the Board of the Law Enforcement? Uh, different mission statements now or come together and support? Can I expect to see Eric Adams out there in force? Well, Eric Adams is no, is no longer a member of the 100 Blacks well, in Law Enforcement, yeah. but I spoke to 
Charles Phillips, who's the chair of the Grand Council of Guardians, and he was supportive of me. Now, I think initially, uh, before I announced my candidacy, they were with Thompson. Now, he has told me that he's with me, but now that Thompson is out as of this morning, I have to uh, talk to Charles Phillips again to ask him, will he now go on the record with the Grand Council of Guardians to support me? I have not made that call yet. But you know, Bill Thompson just yeah. acquiesced this morning. Yeah. So I will um, talk to Charles uh, maybe tomorrow or the next day and then find that out for you. Okay. Rahim? Go on, Rahim, in the back. Yeah. Sister had a high Oh, a I'm sorry. Okay, I have a quick question. Oh. What are you going to do to encourage you to vote for you, a farmer cop, when they have so much animosity towards the office? I think that's a good question. Well, you have to understand that they should vote in their best interest. First of all, uh, I don't think that they hate police officers. I think they hate what police officers do. Um, I think that uh, they would respect good police, and if it was good, I think that in situations where you see babies that are killed and when police officers make inquiries uh, and get the silence treatment. But that's based on their behavior, prior conduct over all these years. A resentment has been built up. Certainly, uh, they have no love for somebody who just killed a one-year-old. But at the same time, they have this policy to be quiet because of a real, deep-seated uh, resentment for police officers. If they see me as the mayor, this would be the first time they can really see themselves because this is somebody that loves them and that's unborn and unborn. Where, uh, respectfully, with Dave Dinkins, he was not independent. <coughs> uh, Might have been a gentleman, a nice man, <coughs> but he was far from independent. I'll truly be independent because Wall Street didn't make me. Corporate America didn't make me, so I have no allegiance to them. My only allegiance is the people like the people that are in this room. So I would make those youth, I would um, set up a situation where they're going to be police officers, parole officers, and court officers, correction officers, and the like, because I would develop a, a program that they would be from junior high school, that was an explorer type program where they would be explorers in junior high school, and I would guarantee them that when they go to high school, if they can um, get a certain level, whether it's a 75 and maintain that or an 80, they will go to a CUNY college. And the minute they graduate from that college, they go right into the police academy, they go right into the fire department and the like, without even taking a test, because they have already served in these things, and on weekends, they can march with them, they can uh, work with them, and do programs with them. Right when they graduate from CUNY, they wouldn't have to pay. They would go to CUNY for free, and they would become police officers right from there. And that's the kind of system, so it wouldn't even matter about these uh, other, I would have a setup that the five boroughs, that all the employment, not just police officers, sanitation, fire department, all of these uniform forces, that they will all first crack is the five boroughs as opposed to upstate Rockland County and out there in Suffolk County and all that, I would have an in-house in in system to, to employ the five boroughs. And then we would check because they have people living all the way in Jersey that get jobs as cops here mm -hmm. in New York City. We would, we would change all that. The moment I see what high school you went to, that, that's literally disqualifying you from the police department as it currently exists. I would do that mm -hmm. right away. And if they, are, if they want to fight, then they will fight with the Corporation Council because I would concentrate on the five boroughs. I would give them every kind of point system you can to give them an advantage so that they will be able to get these jobs as opposed to these grandfathers who were sanitation men or firefighters and now their grandsons are firefighters and their whole family become now. That, all that stuff ends if I get it. Just one quick question, and I'm sorry I had my hand up. First, for everybody. I know, I figured that's my stuff. But, uh, Mike, one quick question. Since you spent so much time talking about police brutality and police criminality, who would you see as your 
commission. Ah, I'll commission. give you a hint. Mm -hmm. the, the person is in um, 100 Blacks in Law Force. Okay. 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 All right. And if anybody knows me well already know who I'm going to pick to be the police. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. You've seen it before. Yeah. Maybe on TV. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I just want to thank you, and we want to thank you for coming here. But what I want to ask you, brother, what do you, you need for this uh, out there, right, to help move you forward and let our people know that we have another choice? Because this is a historic time. Mm -hmm. sure. If you see what happened in this primary that just happened, mm -hmm. a lot of the people that thought they was going to win mm -hmm. didn't win. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all we got to do, a house cannot stand without being divided, brother. We got to come together. You got to take the first step. Mm -hmm. We got to take the first step. And we got to bring our people together. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Freedom Party on that side, the Freedom Party on this side. One more other thing. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to get this mail form for you at, at uh, Dr. Curtis in mm -hmm. Manhattan. But Baron had the same thing. The people got to come out and understand that who you are, mm -hmm. right, what you stand for, and let them know by your record mm -hmm. automatically that anybody with common sense should know that uh, rather than having people tell you who to vote for all the time, why not start voting with someone who you know got the record of fighting for what our people need. Yeah. And I just want to know, as far as volunteers, what you need, right? Mm -hmm. Also, you need to put out some placards and things and mm -hmm. get people out so mm -hmm. they can get to the Go into these, these, these housing projects. Mm -hmm. That's what they've been doing. Knock on doors. We got time. It's very short, but we got to do it. And I'd like to expound on that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question. I think um, over this next six weeks, we want to first get the equal time on the airwaves that everyone else has got. I think, you know, certainly we could think of some ingenious ways to, in, to run a poor people's campaign, but um, I thought it was an opportunity to come here because I heard the term uh, a couple of years ago, guerrilla journalism. And so I said, this is the place to be. So, uh, for one thing, I want the equal time. I saw the hours that Lou got, that de Blasio got on all these black radio programs. I want equal time. I'm just going to say, what about me? If you can give all that time to those who do not have our interests at heart, you gave all these hours to someone who's going to uphold and undergird white supremacy. You've given all that time to someone that if a black woman was raped here tonight on their way home, none of them would support her. See, I'm going to be your brother regardless. If you get raped, I'm going to be there for you. They can't say that. So I would hope in a perfect world, if I get the message out, if I can get the airwaves, if I can get whether it's the TV time and whether it's the radio, and let them see a glimpse of what I've done, then they have an idea of what I'll do. But they get the vote and come back to a black church and say thank you. I heard a lady on the radio yesterday say she's a member of Abyssinia. Her words were Lou and de Blasio visited her church. When Reverend Butt said you can leave if you're busy because I know you have other stops. She said that de Blasio immediately left. And since Lou stayed, she said, well, Lou loves our people because he stayed. I'm like, oh my goodness. Lou was there because we represent the largest block in the, in the, um, in the city. They say we represent 26, 27 percent, whatever it might be. If they say it's 26, I guarantee you one day it's better than 40. If they tell you it's 26 percent, I guarantee you the voters, we're about 40 percent. Now, there's a lot of Latinos in the city, but they can't all vote. I guarantee you that it's that 40 percent that's very attractive 
to Lou, to Quinn, to Blase on over. They ain't in black churches for their health. They in black churches for that it's part of their agenda because they know that if you come to a black church and you get that poor pig, you can get their vote. If the if the pastors in our churches were dignified, they wouldn't allow them in the church. They should allow me because of the stands I've taken. They should say, well, let me check your resume. Oh, no, 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 no. You've always been there for our community. You can come in. They can't come in. But they come in and they get to speak right there in the poor pit. And that's supposed to be sanctimonious. But they can speak up there. There was a time when black women couldn't even talk in the church. Am I lying? No. I remember when, when black women could hardly speak in the church. And they let these white men come in there and say anything they want to say in the church and get our vote. And the only thing they come back and say thank you. When they go back to white communities, they don't say thank you. They give them something. When you go to the single community, do you think that they just want to thank you? You better, you better come there with something of substance. All our people get is a thank you. When Schumer got into office, when he became senator, all he said was thank you. <laughs> yeah, you said that in a few places. All these people, that's all you get from them. So I'm saying that if given a level playing field, and I say the things that I want to do, whether it's with employment, whether it's with a second chance, or first offenders, whether it's, whether it's with stop questioning Fritz, whether it's with uh, low income housing, when they'll tell you something like, well, we're going to keep it at between 90 and 120 low income units, I'll double that or triple it. So I don't have those limits that they have. Everything they're going to do, I'm going to do so much more of it that's better. That if I get this equal time, call Gary Bird. Ask him why I'm not on the air. Call uh, Pickett and Slade. Ask them why I'm not on the air. Now, if you don't think, if you think that they, their shows are independent, if you think their shows are independent, ask them why I'm not on the air. Mark Riley, if you think his show is independent, ask them why Michael Grace is not on the air. BAI. BAI also. Ask them why I'm not on the air. You call them. Call in an answer. If they're independent, let's see what they say. Have the mega churches refused to have you speak to the congregation? Well, I've been waiting because I was not a part of the primary since I'm a part of the okay. uh, general election in all fairness. Uh -huh. I have not asked them yet. Okay. Now, I'm going to have my team call all of them. Good. And I'm going to wait and see what the response I'd is. Like now, to know. they let Lou and all these other ones in their church. Yeah, I know. Now, if they don't let me in, I want y'all to ask them why not. That's what I want That's to right. do. That's, That's why right. I want to know. Right. Yeah. Especially over at the Christian Life Center because I know Bloomberg got in because of that. Well, because I went up. I mean, CCC? Well, yes. Uh -huh. oh. uh, yeah. I do know, though, uh, Brother Mike, uh, in all fairness, every one of these politicians have a, a team where they're going into these places asking to speak. Yes. Or their person is asking mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, whoever asks, what can uh, my email, I think, mm -hmm. ask, what can we do for Kareem? What can he and the others do for you? That you need. You need well, that's what I said. You, uh, you need a team of people to approach these people. Yeah, I said, I said, we're going to have our team. We can't just call them and say, look for them to call you. We, the we, night is not going to happen. Oh, okay, but here's in what. In the meantime, I'm going to try and see if I can get you on. Um, for the Caribbean population with Brian Figaro. He has a radio station and all the Caribbean folks listen to his program. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give him a call tomorrow just to see what can be worked out there. If you fall, my brother. Oh, I got that. <laughs> but the chair don't have the balance. <laughs> so, uh, uh, before we close out though, I think that I was just saying to, um, to Milton, we haven't heard a word from our public advocate. Yeah. Well, well, I, well he can, can he come up and just join you sure in? Sure. We can hear what his platform is. And I'll also put in the word to Gary Bird. Uh, 
Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. This is what you need. You need somebody to be the forerunner. Right. So Sister Veronica? Right. Um, Brother Michael, I would like a, maybe a two-minute rundown on the, the con some of the candidates, their position on maybe the Central Park and things that they could have done that they had not done, or well, a little I, snippet of what well, put it this way. I have a long history with the Central Park 7, and the proof is I don't call it fine. That's part of the proof. Mm -hmm. I remember when it was 7. I remember when they were all bailed out. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing them young men as young men in, in the course, seeing them go back into prison and had to stay through their formative years in jail. I've always maintained their innocence. I didn't have to see a documentary by some white folks to convince me that it's okay to say that they were innocent. So the, the, the elected officials, I've heard Lou say he saw the documentary and the Blasio and them alike say that they'll do something when they come into office. <laughs> Why did they do something uh, they going back 20 years ago? That's right. yeah. Or 10 years ago since they've been in public office. You don't wait till you run for an, uh, an office now to do something. I didn't wait for now to say, okay, now we got to get John White out of jail. We did that then. See, the thing is, it's very easy when, you, when you're looking at at least 40% of the voting blocks, you want to appeal to them, so you say something that you know is an apparent injustice, and it's safe to say. So the documentary made it safe, so they all say it was a tragedy. They didn't say that then. They've never come after Kelly. Kelly says to this very day, that was a good investigation, and those cops did a real good job, and they came up with the perpetrator, and that they did it. That's what Kelly says to this day. Yes, sir. So how could Bill Thompson just say he wouldn't keep Kelly? After all this time, last time when he ran, he said he's a Kelly man. Because he wanted, he wanted the endearment of, of others. Others. So I'm saying that all of them have had time to weigh in on the Central Park case. Why are they all now, and, and, and even at this late date, Chris and Quinn stood with Kelly. But the rest of them said that they were um, going to do something when they got in office. Then why did they wait all these years? They should have went after the mayor years ago. Do you know how long ago Mateus Reyes said he did it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know how long ago that was? Yes, so to let all of them out, and I'm not Michael Lloyd, I'm not a lawyer, but a part of the law is recompense. You don't say, oh, sorry, and let them out of jail. Mm -hmm. Now you've got to repay them. If you're sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're sorry, you got to repay them. So they, they haven't championed the cause of them getting a dime from the city. Now, had they been in other ethnicity, all of them would have been out. A long time ago. Mm -hmm. A long time ago. Yes. Right. Michael Lloyd, why don't you come up? I come on, come on. Yes. Uh, here's the new. This is, uh, this is the next public advocate. Good evening, and excuse the hoarseness of my voice as the parade yesterday um, was a very exciting and well um, attended event. Yes. From my perspective, and I don't know if many of you know much about my background, but I'm a native New Yorker. I attended public school here in New York City. Um, I also attended parochial high school. Um, I took my law degree out of Rutgers. I got a bachelor's out of the University of Massachusetts. But just some highlights and things that I'm very aware of our people are very much impacted by it, but don't see the long, the long view of what's happening to them. You know, every year or every two years, there's the Rent Guidelines Board votes as to what should happen to the regulated rents in this city, be that rent control or rent stabilization. Since Rudy Giuliani was the mayor, 
I believe that there has been somewhere around a 30% increase in regulated rents. And these are not just straight increases. These are compound increases. You, nobody's salary in New York, in my community, whether that community is in Queens, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, uptown Manhattan, has had a 30% income increase, let alone compound. It, it's not a happening. And the upshot of it, when you combine that with stop and frisk, when you combine that with an unemployment rate that is sky high and focused in our communities, what you really got going on for the last 30 years is ethnic cleansing. If you're a family and your 16-year-old son or daughter is constantly being stopped, frisked, harassed, eventually you don't want to live in the city. You would like to move with someplace where your family has a an opportunity to live in peace. These schools are failing our children. Our children make up 85% of the school population that's black and brown. The test scores, can't blame me, the test scores say that the children are not being appropriately educated. People in our communities work very hard to find jobs. It appears to me that if you live in a certain zip code, when you send your resume or your application, that zip code is um, not one of the places that employers would like their employees to live, quite frankly. And those are our zip codes. We're, the campaign itself is really taking a look at where our population lives. And we're coming, we're coming up with some clear delineations and demarcations of where we are living. And when I say we, I'm talking about black folks. At first, we will begin to take a look at some Hispanics in the weeks to come, where they're living. The Hispanics have a candidate in the race. I think his name is Mr. Carrion. He's coming out of the um, Independence Party that is owned and operated by Lenore Filani. <laughs> right. Now, it's interesting as to how that's going to play out. But we are sure that if we can get our message out, our numbers are the bulk of the identifiable groups in this city. When these races started out, you had a Jew, an Italian, an Irish woman, a black, and an Asian, and a Hispanic running. Now we're at a point where you have an Italian and a white ethnic, Mr. Logan. It appears that Cassiomedes, the Greek,
may remain in the race because as I understand it, he may have filed papers as an independent as well as a uh, Republican. We are the only black candidates that have survived. The, we went through a, a tremendous effort to make signatures. We're not, we're not on the ballot by gratis. We're on the ballot because they can't take us off. It was a tremendous effort. And we can heal the city. We think that we can convince these angry, no future young men to put the big toys down and to move on to some positive self-development. You know, a lot of these young guys, they turn to the narcotics trade to make money. That became their small business. Well, with Mr. Graves' help, we think that we can develop some alternative small business opportunities. And let's face it, our young people are very talented. Yes, they are. They can take nothing and make something out of it. And that's what they've been forced to do. That's what they are capable of doing. And we want to provide them with an opportunity to be all that they can be. And we're going to face a lot of opposition even if we win. White folks don't want to see this happen. They truly want to remove our presence from the city. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. You know, Bloomberg refused for eight years mm -hmm. to ratify and sign city union contract arrangements with the workers. Mm -hmm. And all the future money that the city would have been able to accommodate those contract demands were given away as tax breaks to real estate developers. And that's where the salaries of the little people for the next 20 years has been spent. Yes. Now, my mayor, Mr. Graves, is going to have a hard time arm wrestling with these unions. Many of them are us. Yes. And we know that we need our money because it's so little. I have talked to him about taking the money out of police overtime. <laughs> now, he's not necessarily a fan of that, but the money's got to come from somewhere, and I don't know that we'll be able to break any of these real estate tax gifts that have sponsored many of these high-rise, Developments in thirty-five hundred dollars a month for rent. Maybe. It's obvious that they have no plans to accommodate our community and our people. We have to turn that around. Yes. Now, if you remember the transit union tried to take the mayor on. The mayor 
with a black judge, I believe, <laughs> broke the transit union. So, and I just want to say one thing about Bill Thompson. And y'all may not know this, and I'm going to say it. His daddy was the one that stripped all the Maddox of his license. That was the Judge Thompson that took all the Maddox's license. Now, I don't run behind all the Maddox, but he is the most brilliant legal mind that I've had an opportunity to be around. And I've been around some of the best. I hung around with, um, now nah, his name just walked off my tongue. The, the Bill, Bill Kunstler. Kunstler, I thought you were going to say And I played around with some cases with him. He was a good fellow. He didn't win a lot. I spent two years in Lynn Stewart's office, writing some back, some briefs for her and whatnot. She has put our life on the line for black people multiple, multiple times. Many of y'all might remember Larry Davis. Yes. Lynn Stewart is suffering in a federal penitentiary as we speak. After the Compassionate release has been signed by the prison authorities, but they won't let her go. And she was a nice white woman. Do you understand me? You know what I'm talking about. Salt of the earth. We have not, as a community, stepped up for her. That's our fault. Our memories are short. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things when the brother asks, what can you do? Stay on the radio talk shows. Let them know that you know that they are following orders to ignore us. Because they do not want our message to get out they do not want our population to become involved. They want to keep us asleep. They want to keep our nose so close to the cement that we cannot look up and see what's going on. Now, if you look around the country at schools, the biggest thing in Texas, Oklahoma, High school football. Yeah. Ain't been no high school football in New York in 40 years. It's just not happening. They still, I think, have a little basketball in the high schools. But what the mayor has done in terms of using these large high school properties is to break them up into individual small schools. Not only bringing in the charters taking space from the public schools, but creating an environment where there's no cohesion by separation, segregation, every strata possibly imaginable. Part time. Mm -hmm. It is disruptive of the human spirit that our communities are not able to feel like we are one and have an allegiance to each other. It's by design. We have to combat that, and Mayor Graves and I have pledged to do so. 
Y'all saw me in a little jaw jack a little earlier when some of y'all might have seen that. I'm going around pricking boils. Because we're going to get some of this poison out that exists in our community. I haven't told Mayor Graves this, but I probably will be very late to arrive on Wednesday at our normal meetings. Because I'm going to the other Freedom Party meetings in Harlem that happens at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see what they are really saying. Because notwithstanding what I opine, y'all may not feel this way, but I opine that they have improperly done some things around this Freedom Party thing. They still if they are the Freedom Party, and they call themselves the Freedom Party, then they have to support Mayor Graves. They don't have a choice. It's unfortunate that they might not like it, but that's what they got to do. It's unfortunate that some people might be at odds with Alton, but I ain't Alton Maddox. He ain't all that matters. And we got a job to do. It's in for their benefit. And they got to help us do it. That's correct. And so, I will be around stepping on toes and pricking boils. Because we're going to get some of this poison out of this community. And that's what I intend to do to make sure that Michael Graves gets to be mayor this town. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to see what you would say about the uh, significance of the Afro that uh, to me won the election. The, the Afro, the what? what? The Blasio Sons Afro. What well, <laughs> well let, me, I, let me just say, since it's, it seems to be a mayoral question, <laughs> I just wanted to jump on it first. Truth be told. See, it's interesting what he said. He said that the Afro won the election and the bad thing about it, I know what he's talking about. Because I shouldn't know what he's talking about. I should say, what Afro? Because there might be a few Afros in the room. Not like that. <laughs> now, now think about it. You have the current mayor accusing de Blasio of playing the race card by illuminating his son's so-called Afro. Now, the mayor said that he would never play that type of race card. Sure. Yeah. The mayor said that he's never gotten in front of anyone yeah. and elucidated that he's Jewish. Jewish. Now, he's right in a sense. Now, I don't have a problem saying that the mayor is right. Wow. Because a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> so the mayor is right because he does not get in front of you and push this thing about being Jewish. He's right. Okay. But he doesn't have to. Right. That's the difference. Yes. Now, if I was to put a cleaners in the middle of Crown Heights, mm. would I get the Cedar to come to my cleaners or the Jewish cleaners next door. <laughs> now, what if, what if I clean the clothes better and what if my prices were better? Would I still get the seat? No, no, sir. No, sir. Now, would the rabbi have to tell them not to do it or do they know it already not to, not to patronize my cleaners? So the mayor is right. He does not have to politicize a community that's already been politicized. So he doesn't have to push being Jewish 
to Jewish people because they know what he's doing, what he is already. Consequently, they have a collective consciousness. So he don't have to tell them, support me because I'm Jewish. Support this person because they're Jewish. They already know. So, of course, if his person in the race was Christine Quinn, and Christine Quinn was being beat now by this other person, de Blasio, who used a so-called black family <laughs> as a way to get in. And he says, well, I wouldn't use a Jewish family. Yeah, well, he's right, because he doesn't have to. Right. So he was right when he said that about de Blasio. De Blasio believes our people is of the mindset that if he shows his son and says, He's against stop questioning Frisk because he has a black son. We automatically believe it. We believe that he's against stopping Frisk now because he has a black son. Here he's been in office all of that time, and before that, a city council member all of that time never spoke out against stop questioning Frisk, but can get in front of you with a black son with an afro and say, I'm against stop questioning Frisk because of him, and you believe it. And vote for him over 40 percent. <laughs> so it worked. What well, he did work. Yes. You can't fault success. Hey. It worked. He worked. Right now, you got people saying he's all right because he's married to a black woman. Yeah. Hmm. Was Thomas Jefferson all right? <laughs> Was Strong Thurman all right? <laughs> Strong Thurman hated black folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Him and Jesse Helms mm -hmm. built what's not a modern Republican Party. It's framed in their image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they didn't love no black folks, mm -hmm. but they, but they loved black women. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson, who was the originator of the Democratic Party, you got to remember, back then the Democratic Party was for slavery. Yeah. They were pro-slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that we should, we should be at a point now where we should be more sophisticated and understand just because you like to sleep with black women don't mean you like black people. Yeah, that's right. Because a lot of white cats, I, I'm almost going to say most, but I'll just say a lot of white men marry white women, but they love to sleep black on occasion. So he's one of them, and, and I won't get into those other things about he was prior to and what she was prior to, it don't matter. I'm just saying that they are who they are, but we should not be misled and vote for them based on his son's Afro. We should be better than that. Yes, sir. Well put. I think the people here are. Well put. <laughs> well, here, yeah, but obviously, it, what, what else did he do to get that 40%? What, what did he do so deserving to get over 40% of the black vote? I know. He did what Bloomberg accused him of. He used his black family. The same I'm with you. Sister Ali have a question. I, I want to just quickly address that. Not at the direct level. The Italians have taken New York State if they can cement de Blasio in this the mayoralty seat in the city of New York. And that sets the stage for Andrew Cuomo to run for president. Okay. Oh. Now, I mean, I'll just show you. Okay. <laughs> we all have, you know, I have, I have some moments too. I said, don't delay me. Next time. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to ask the Reverend Oliver a question. Devin Oliver and I, been, we've been discussing the Constitution. And both you brothers are very, very astute and very conscious of what it means to us as a people when we put our hand on the Bible. When you win this election, you're going to have to put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and swear that you will uphold the Constitution. And as we all know, the Constitution is a flawed document. 
doesn't even recognize us as people. Where do you think, or what can you think, your position or your 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 term in office can do to help us change that? We back to have as for rewriting of the Constitution, and this is something that we've been discussing in our BSAC movement because we're going to get that movement going to change that uh, law, that Constitution, because um, yes, because anybody who actually do not uphold the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to jump up one second and get my copy of the Constitution. Hand me my bag. Hand me my bag. Hand me my bag. Hand me my Constitution. Well, well, let, let me say you, Sister Howard. Yeah. First of all, I knew that it would be uh, uh, a difficult question when you said you and um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got together on this because. Yeah. No, 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 come on, I know, I know, and I know when you know when heavyweights get together, they don't come with a lightweight question. <laughs> I, I would say that certainly knowing and understanding the original framers of the Constitution and understanding what original intent is, when you hear a Buchanan, when you hear a uh, certain right wing uh, personalities on Fox, Oftentimes you hear them use the term original intent. And unfortunately they are right when they talk about original intent because they're saying that the so-called fathers of this nation never meant for Dr. Jeffries to travel from here in Africa and talk about injustices here and talk about um, um, imbalances with respect to how America's and the Western powers treatment and colonialization of Africa and what it really owes Africa, how it exploits Africa, how it exploits the Caribbean, original intent never meant for him to be able to travel freely. As a matter of fact, original intent in, uh, restricted our ability to travel. So obviously the framers never meant for world leaders to um, be able to congregate on free soil somewhere and talk about our present condition. So the leaders in various African countries, it was never meant for them to gather in one location and plan and decide from step A and what's B, what's C and D and the like. The original framers never meant that to be. They never meant for a black man to be able to sit in front of you with a weapon on his side and have that kind of authority that you, you told, if you told uh, Madison that, and you told Jefferson, and that they would all say you crazy. They never meant for that. They never meant for you to be able to get on a train or a plane and fly to, to another country, to Jamaica, and speak to the ambassador of Jamaica or the president. No, that that was never meant in original intent. It was never meant for us to chart our own course and plead our own case. So oftentimes when you hear uh, the O'Reilly's and all of them talk about original intent, yeah, that, they, they're, they're right. They know what they're talking about. And so if you want to talk about whether the 14th Amendment has any bearing for us or the 13th or the 15th, you know, these so-called Civil War amendments or trade amendments, whatever you want to call them, <coughs> Uh, you can make a good argument on that, but there is no way in the world that if I was to become mayor, that I can give you your citizenship. I just know that I've changed things in these five boroughs. Now, in terms of emancipating 50 million of us in this country, the movement that you, you're, you're setting up, I respect that and I concur. And whatever you can get in, in terms of reparations, I'm all for. Whatever you can do to better guarantee our safety in Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and all the places. And especially when you see somebody in South Dakota, North Dakota, that look like us. Certainly, if you could do anything to, 
to, to enhance federal protections of, of our people wherever they might be, then that's good. But that's not going to be done by any mayor, but I can affect change in the five boroughs, you know, and misbehavior can be costly. I can make them pay for their inherent racism. But um, outside of the boroughs, no. But I would say that I salute your efforts because these things were not truly ratified. So when you hear uh, certain people in office saying that the 14th Amendment was not ratified in a proper quorum, uh, they're right. So, you know, maybe, you know, certain parts of the Constitution and amendments are on life support right now because they're chopping away at gains that over the last 50 years happened. They're chopping away. So if we don't watch out, we're going to lose even the things that we have. It's going to go backwards. The clock is going to go backwards. They're going to take us back to their golden age where they can do whatever they want. And so I salute all those types of efforts. May I? May I? Absolutely. I brought some questions. I didn't intend to get into this tonight because we'd be here not only tomorrow night, but next year or two. I've had Dr. Oliver on a community cop a few times. And we're still shaking from when he was on. But he was good, though. He was excellent. I want to assist from the brothers. It's getting a bit late. Uh, should we let our esteemed guests uh, give us the uh, wrapping up remarks? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, we can do that. I mean, obviously, we'll have them again as guests before the election several times. Good. Just a brief word on the Constitution of the United States. The 14th Amendment is something that we've all been familiar with, and we think that that was the golden key to our salvation. However, we overlook, and white folks are finding this out, poor white folks, lower middle class white folks are finding out very clearly that it's the 14th Amendment that breathed life into the corporate structure of America that we have today. Corporations yes. became, Human. became legitimate entities via the 14th Amendment, and that was part of the trade-off to get it passed. As for a closing remark, I want to thank you very much for having us. It is through you, this study group, that we will find our voice. Folks in this room are writers. They are media people. And if it, if it happens at all, it rests on your shoulders more than ours. Uh, certainly, I would like to thank our brother Armani for doing not only inviting us for what he does week in and week out for you. Certainly, it goes without saying that uh, the uh, leader of um, our great and invaluable institution, uh, Sankofa Academy, of which I've uh, come by and um, supported in the past and I'll continue to support, certainly uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, our sister. so much that she does, and not only here at St. Cope Academy, with the Freedom Retreat, and, and believe me, um, when St. Cope Academy, uh, it'll literally bring you to tears for what they did in South Carolina. Uh, the people couldn't get enough of them. I mean, they, you know, you, if you want to show out, you take the students here, and you take them to, to the Gullah Festival, and believe me, you talk about impressing people. They couldn't get enough of them. So certainly, you know, Ali McLean needs to be thanked for so much that she does here and other places. So yes, thank you, sister. Okay. 
And I would just say that in closing, just want to thank all of you so much for inviting me, and certainly our brother Kareem, who was vigilant in um, inviting us. Uh, thank you all so much. And I'll end by telling you that uh, I've gotten a lot of encouraging remarks uh, along the road, but the most encouraging remark came from a sister named Sybil Clark. Yes, sir. Who, mm -hmm. the wife, right of the great historian, mm -hmm. Dr. John Henry Clark. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. She told Walter Maddox, I want to talk to Michael. And I was in the back of the room August 17th, you know, uh, Dr. Garvey's uh, birthday. And um, she was up in the front. And Walter Maddox came over there and said, uh, you know, Sybil Clark wants to talk to you. And I said, okay, brother, I'll, I'll talk to her later. And he said, no, no, no. She wants to talk to you right now. And I said, okay, you know, the program was going on, so I, you know, I said, okay, let me walk up to the front. I didn't want to, you know, stop the flow, but I went up there, and I could not believe what she said in my ear. She said, brother, I want you to do this for Megan. Mm -hmm. And I, hold on, hold on. Yes, sir. She said that she put something on my shoulders. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, gotta move. So I'll just stop there. You know, we have to move forward. In life. You know, when she said that, that meant a lot to me for her to tell me. Yes, sir. To do this for Megan Evans. Yes, sir. Yes. That was enough for me, so my mission is clear now. I'm yes, doing this for Megan. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir.